5,000 years ago, the Egyptians invented something astonishing, the pyramid. For 100 years, the Egyptians continued to build more pyramids, always very close to the first one. Every one of these was a huge construction requiring thousands of workers and millions of tons of raw material. And then suddenly, for no apparent reason, they moved the whole operation north to a brand new site. But the pharaohs were not simply content to change site once. Despite huge logistical problems, they kept changing location in the Nile Valley. Something very powerful was driving them to ceaselessly choose new places to build pyramids. But what was it? To investigate this mystery, Egyptologist Dominic Montserrat and archaeologist Miriam Cook go on the trail of the wandering pyramids. To trace hundreds of years of pyramid building, the Egypt detectives have taken to their mobile headquarters, letting the river take the strain of carrying them between the sites. For the pharaohs building those monuments, however, things were not so simple. Each time a new location was chosen, a whole city of laborers, stonemasons, architects, and surveyors had to be moved, resettled, and supplied. The whole extraordinary project had begun, logically enough, close to the ancient capital, Memphis, from where building work could easily be overseen. But then, quite suddenly, that site was abandoned in favor of a new location at Giza. But even here, the pharaohs were not content, and they moved again, and again, and yet again, eventually ending up close to where the whole project had started, at Saqqara. For years, experts have argued over whether it was purely practical considerations or some deeper religious reason that drove the moves. Why isn't there just one great pyramid field where each pharaoh could rest surrounded by his predecessors? Archaeologists have not yet reached a consensus, and the Egypt detectives are no exception. This is the situation we have. This is the pyramids at Saqqara, mm. with the Nile, and then the move up to Giza. And mm. well, we need to explain why. Well, these are religious monuments. The Egyptians are incredibly particular about their sacred spaces. So I wonder if there isn't some religious aspect of the Giza Plateau that influences the relocation. Dominic's years of research suggest to him a religious explanation, but Miriam is after archaeological evidence. Was it significant that the first pyramid built at the new northerly location was the massive Great Pyramid? Building the Great Pyramid was the most challenging engineering feat that they'd ever attempted. The puzzle must have something to do with that. The move north must have solved engineering or structural problems. Well, what problems? Well, that's what we need to find out. To discover what practical considerations drove pharaohs to choose a pyramid site, Miriam has decided to look more closely at the construction and location of the earliest pyramid of all, built around 2650 BC at Saqqara. This was the first in what would soon become an essential part of the pharaoh's burial rite. Egyptians believed that the pharaoh was resurrected as Osiris, king of the dead. So to ensure his smooth transition into the afterlife, Great care was taken not only with mummifying his body, but also with providing him with a suitable tomb from which he could ascend to heaven. This was the origin of the pyramids. The Egyptians were great pragmatists. Take this first pyramid right behind me here at Saqqara. It's called the Step Pyramid, and it looks very different to the other pyramids. Its sides are stepped, not smooth. And it's these very steps that tell a story. Before this pyramid was built, the elite of ancient Egypt 
were buried in flat roof tombs called mastabas. Look at this first step. It's obviously the first thing to be built. And the incredible thing is they could have stopped right here. Without going any further, they'd already created a low-lying flat roof tomb called a mastaba. Until the step pyramid, the kings had been very happy to be buried within these mastabas. So the builders could have packed up their tools and gone home. But they didn't. They had an inspiration. Why not build big and place more mastabas on top of the first? And that's just what they did. And then they built another, and then another, and then another. And the result was the very first pyramid. I think the evolution of all the pyramids was the result of these practical what-if experiments. The ancient Egyptians became increasingly ambitious, testing the limits of their skills and their raw materials. But Dominic isn't easily convinced by the practical argument. He's searching for a deeper spiritual answer among Egypt's ancient religious records. Miriam, meanwhile, went in search of a concrete example to prove her point. Could she unearth practical reasons why the pharaoh Khufu had first decided to move away from Saqqara and build far to the north at Giza? To find out, she has arranged to meet a leading Egyptian geologist, Dr. Bache Asawi, to discover more about the ancient Egyptians' most essential raw material. And limestone was used in building all of the pyramids. What makes it such a perfect building material? It's a very durable uh, kind of rock. And uh, secondly, Egypt is very rich in limestone. And third, is that it has uh, layering and jointing, which help quarrying the types of limestone. So the layers actually dictate the size of the blocks? Yes, certainly. And you can see, you can see the layers. This is the size. This is the maximum size. The rocks can be cut from these layers. So the pharaoh Khufu's grand plans could have been limited by the size and availability of the limestone blocks at Saqqara. So when they wanted to build a bigger pyramid, they were actually limited by the raw material here. Yeah, and uh, not only this, but also because of the space also. You don't have quite a good space here to build bigger pyramids. And so they had to go to a different place. Oh, yeah, indeed they did. <laughs> After almost 100 years of pyramid building at Saqqara, the new pharaoh Khufu found the site could not cope with his ambition to build the greatest pyramid of all time. So he moved his entire operation north to Giza. Well, we're here at Giza. What made this a better place to build? If you look at the stones behind you, you find that you have several layers of rocks. And this, this limestone is a lot more easy to get out Yes, then. the joints on both sides and then the bedding planes, then you can easily pull the rock from, the, from its original place. So it is unfinished blocks? Yeah, that's why, that's how they, uh, they do it, you see, by chiseling the, uh, along the joints by harder rocks. And that's how they cut this uh, into big pieces, of course, depending on the joints and on the bedding planes. And that's why they came here, because uh, uh, it's bigger blocks than any other place in, uh, in the area. Dr. Desawi's theory suggests that it was the availability of larger stone blocks and a greater expanse of flat ground on which to build that persuaded Khufu to abandon the burial site of his ancestors and move to Giza. Practical reasons from a practical pharaoh. Giza was the perfect place. Plenty of limestone blocks to work with and a solid base upon which to begin building one of the wonders of the world, the Great Pyramid. How do you account for the next pyramid? They didn't build that here at Giza, but miles away over there at Abu Ruash. I don't see the problem with that. There was plenty of good limestone up there as well. Well, bear with me. We'll go on up to Abu Ruash and I'll show you a more powerful reason than geology for building pyramids up here in the north. Simple geology might explain why building moved from Saqqara to Giza. But what Miriam can't explain is why the next pharaoh then abandoned this apparently perfect site and moved again. Perhaps it's time to see if Dominic really can discover more compelling answers deep in Egypt's ancient religion.
Egypt detectives are trying to discover why pharaohs built the pyramids where they did. But competing theories mean tensions are rising. Miriam Cook, an archaeologist, is drawn towards a practical, geological solution. While Egyptologist Dominic Montserrat believes the location of the pyramids is the key to a greater mystery, whose solution lies in the religious beliefs of the pharaohs themselves. So why, after the Great Pyramid was built at Giza, did the next pharaoh, Jedifre, move the building operation yet again to Abu Ruash? Well, you brought me here to Abu Ruash, and I'm standing on the pyramid, but it doesn't look very finished to me. That's right, it probably never was finished. It's always seemed like an odd thing to do, to come all the way up here to build if there's all that marvelous building stone on the Giza Plateau. I just don't find the geological argument accounts for everything. Well, how would you explain it then, Dominic? Well, if we'd been standing up here four and a half thousand years ago, we'd have been able to see Heliopolis, and I think that's a really important clue. And why is that? Well, if you buy me a cup of coffee, I might just tell you. OK, you're on. Heliopolis, the center of sun worship in ancient Egypt and the city at the heart of the pharaoh's beliefs. A city now lost in suburban sprawl. But what has this to do with pyramids? Well, I've got your coffee here, but first I want you to explain why you think Heliopolis is so important for the move to Abu Ruash and Giza. If you look at the names of the pharaohs who built at Giza and Abu Ruash, you see something really interesting. Because first of all, you've got Jedefre at uh, Abu Ruash, and then Kaefre, Kefrem. And Menkare, who built the third pyramid at Giza. Menkare, exactly. And what have these three pharaohs all got in common? Re in their names. The sun god Re was clearly central to the beliefs of these pharaohs, so much so that they even adopted his name. For them, he was the god who sailed across the sky in his solar boat by day and across the underworld of the dead by night. When they died, these kings also believed they would join him on this journey, a journey that would begin when their bodies were laid to rest in their immortal monument, their pyramid. Well, Heliopolis was the city of the sun, wasn't it? They must have been worshippers of his cult because they all chose names which honored him. Well, you can have your coffee now. Oh, thank you. But we still know so little about Heliopolis. Well, that's right. It's just a suburb of modern Cairo now. Might be worth checking out. The site of Heliopolis today has been overwhelmed by the suburbs of Cairo. But do any clues survive to link these sun pharaohs with their sun city? And can these provide a solution more compelling than Miriam's? Miriam has arranged to meet Dr. David Jeffries, a veteran archaeologist who spent years trying to unravel the secrets of the lost city of Heliopolis and its connections to the cult of sun worship. David takes Miriam to a place right in the center of what was the ancient city, where they can get a bird's eye view of the area. Whew, you okay? Why, oh, right. Well, it's definitely worth the climb. We've got a, a wonderful view from up here. Um, we're looking over the town and temple area of Heliopolis. At first, the view from the minaret made Heliopolis seem even more mysterious. One of the greatest religious complexes of ancient Egypt, engulfed by urban sprawl and smothered with haze. But in the mist, there is a clue. An obelisk built many years after the pyramids, but linked to the days of the pyramid builders, Archaeologists have discovered that it marks the original site of a massive, long-lost sun temple devoted to the worship of the sun god, Re. After years of research, David Jeffries has put together a theory to explain why pyramid building sites were changed. Right, well, here's the obelisk. Um, in order to be comfortable, shall we just go over into the shade? Yeah, that's and, a good uh, idea. Discuss this? Yeah. Yeah. Right, well, we're standing here in Sun City. We have to find a spot out of the sun, at least. Let's, uh, let's talk about it here. So if we've got a huge sun temple, 
and pharaohs who are building pyramids who are associated with the Sun cult. What's the link? Well, it's interesting because the uh, whole question of distribution of pyramids is, is not really well understood. Mm. They, they seem to skip about in, a, in an almost random way. Yeah. But one thing that is significant is that when the Sun cult becomes important to the royal family, yeah. they move to Giza and then to Abarawash, and really that's when the connection with the Sun cult becomes really clear. Right. Raj Edef, who is the first one to have Ra, the sun, Ray, the sun, in his name, uh, and to call himself the son of the sun, he builds at Abu Rawash, which is the most clearly visible from where we are right. at, at Heliopolis. And then all the Giza pyramids are in a, 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 a direct line of sight with Heliopolis. Four and a half thousand years ago, the pharaohs would have been able to see the sun temple here at Heliopolis from their pyramids at Giza and Abu Ruash. David Jeffries believes that this view from tomb to temple was central to their religion. But not everywhere across the Nile had such a clear view. On the outskirts of Cairo stands an escarpment known as the Citadel Rock. This would have blocked the view of the Sun Temple at Heliopolis from many locations across the river. So perhaps the pharaohs that followed the Sun Cult were choosing the location of their tombs in order to ensure that they did have a view of Heliopolis. So it's all about lines of sight? It could well be, yes. For the followers of the Sun Cult, so the theory goes, seeing really was believing. As the pharaohs became more obsessed with worshipping the sun, they had to choose pyramid sites which would guarantee a good view of the center of Heliopolis. So the pharaoh Jedifre had built his pyramid at Abu Ruash to ensure he had a clear view of the temple of his favored god, Re. The next pharaoh, Ka'efre, went back to Giza, as did his successor, Menkaure, but both chose sites where they still had a clear line of sight with Heliopolis. But the map also shows a weak link in this theory. I think that there's a problem with this lines of sight theory of David Jeffries. The next three pharaohs built their pyramids back near Saqqara at this place called Abu Sir, and they were still worshipping the sun god Re. But the problem is that the line of sight between Abu Sir and the Sun Temple at Heliopolis is blocked by the Citadel Rock. So, is David Jeffries wrong? Why did the pyramid builders at Abu Sir choose a site with no clear view of this vital temple? Miriam decides to invite him to Abu Sir to see if he had an explanation. But he suggests they actually meet just a few miles northeast of the pyramid site, among the ruins of another extraordinary building. And where we're standing is the key site. We're actually on top of the Sun Temple now. We only know of two of them as it is. We're standing on the, the actual tower of the, of the Sun Temple. So what's that structure down there for? Right, well, rather like a pyramid, the Sun Temple is surrounded by its own temple complex. And what we're looking at is, is really a unique uh, structure. We don't have anything quite like it from anywhere else in Egypt. And it's an altar of uh, what is sometimes called Egyptian alabaster or travertine, consisting of four segments that are actually a hieroglyphic sign. Uh, it's the, the offering table with a loaf of bread on it, the sign for Hetep, which means to, to be satisfied or to, to, to make offerings. With its rows of pens for hundreds of sacrificial animals and huge basins for collecting their blood, it was a very substantial and hence important structure. And most significantly of all, from its top, there is a clear line of sight to the pyramids at Abu Sir. But this wasn't the central sun temple at Heliopolis that previous pharaohs had gone to such lengths to be in sight of. So Miriam still needs an answer.
even when the kings are building at Abu Sir, um, the point really is this question of visibility from the center of the sun cult itself at Heliopolis. The Abu Sir pyramids are out of sight from Heliopolis. In building back near their capital at Memphis, these pharaohs had seemingly sacrificed that all-important view, a view previous rulers had gone to huge lengths to protect. Just to the south of Heliopolis, south, south of Cairo, you've got this promontory that sort of sticks out from the, the main cliff line uh, where the uh, Islamic citadel was built. We call it the, the Citadel Rock. And that interrupts the line of sight between Heliopolis and the Abu Sir pyramids. Even though the Abu Sir pyramids are sun kings, but their pyramids are back near close to Memphis and they cannot be seen from the center of the sun cult. But the, the sun temple can. The pyramids at Abu Sir would have had a view of this, their own sun temple, which itself then had a direct line of sight to Heliopolis. What David is suggesting was that this temple created a visual link, a relay between the Abu Sir pyramids and Heliopolis. It is an ingenious solution to the pharaoh's problem of building near their physical capital of Memphis, but also maintaining their connection with their spiritual home at Heliopolis. A uniquely Egyptian answer to reconciling the physical problems of pyramid building with the spiritual demands of the gods. This was the truth behind the riddle of the pyramids. Egyptian kings chose their burial places with an eye to the gods, but also with concern for the massive logistical effort involved in building these legendary structures. Building a pyramid could be a lifetime's work for thousands of people, from stonecutters to priests. But in undertaking such colossal enterprises, everyone knew they had to balance the physical needs of the construction with the spiritual requirements of the pharaoh. Together, these, in the form of the pyramid, ensured Egypt would itself remain a wonder of the world. It's time for the Egypt detectives to compare notes and see whose theory is right. I must admit, I did think that the whole pyramid building business was to do with geology and building blocks, but David has convinced me that there's more to it. I had a feeling it wasn't as straightforward as your geological argument. Yeah, but don't forget that the first move to Giza was about limestone and space, and not sun cults. Well, fair enough. So we're both right. Yep. Chin-chin. <laughs> <laughs>